Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Hello and welcome back, my friends. If you've listened to the show before, or if not, welcome for the first time to you. You are tuned into Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media, and my name is Andrew Lawton. Oh my goodness. I leave you for one week, and this is the country we come back to. Justin Trudeau stealing conservative policies as far as the refugee crisis is concerned, things becoming offensive that I had no idea were offensive before. And a particularly unique one, which is feminists fighting against preferential treatment, even though they want preferential treatment in the same vein as it pertains to employment. Lots to talk about in this week's show, and I look forward to getting down to that. But I I wanted to begin by discussing a couple of related stories here, and they're only related by the fact that I was immersed in this world of what is apparently politically incorrect and I didn't even know was politically incorrect in a segment on my daily radio show the other day. Most of you know by now I'm actually the host of a talk radio show in London, Ontario, called, uh, creatively enough, The Andrew Lawton Show. And because it's a daily show, we get the opportunity, or I get the opportunity, I should say, to cover a lot of the developments on major national, international, and yes, local stories as well, especially when they're changing every day. And that's been something I've been able to do this last couple of weeks with the refugee stuff that's going on, because it's changing every day. The rules are changing. The players are changing. And I was discussing it this week on my show, and I was talking about a couple of things that I'll get to in just a moment. But I started off by laying out what had happened at the Liberal Party press conference where members of Trudeau's refugee task force unveiled the plan. Now, this happened Tuesday afternoon, and on stage you had the Minister of uh, Immigration, Citizenship and Refugees, John McCallum, Canada's Minister of Public Safety, Ralph Goodale, our Minister of Health, Jane Philpott. We had our Minister of Canadian Heritage, uh, for some reason, uh, Minister Melanie Jolie, and we had the Minister of Defence, Harjeet Sajjan. And I was talking about this very matter-of-factly, and I I have some strong thoughts about the Minister of Heritage, by the way. You know, the the fact that the Minister of Heritage was at the refugee strategy rollout uh, event was a little bit peculiar. I mean, unless everyone's getting a Canadian arts grant, I'm not sure why she was there. Perhaps Trudeau needed a woman on the panel, you know, because it's 2015 and all that. But I digress. I was describing Minister Sajan, and I was talking about his qualifications Unrelated, I might add, unrelated was this aside to the topic at hand. And I mentioned offhandedly that this is the guy who is the Sikh warrior in Canada, you know, very well respected by everyone, you know, very well liked for his military service. And then I moved on. I didn't really spend much time on it because it wasn't a segment about him. I was merely mentioning him because all of the cabinet members that Trudeau has are still relatively new to Canadians. Sometimes a reminder helps. Anyway, so then I do what I do in talk radio every day almost. Figure out what the people of London, Ontario, Canada think. Go to the phones. Let's go to the phones. This is what I get to say a number of times a day, and I love it. It's one of my favorite parts of a show. You get to hear a cross-section of beliefs, opinions. Sometimes they're interesting. Sometimes they're boring. Sometimes they're smart. Sometimes they're not. You never know. It's like the Schrodinger's cat of, of radio. You know, you ne- maybe they're a great caller, maybe they're not. You don't know until you put the caller on the air. Now, one caller took issue with my description of Minister Sajan. And I have re-listened to this since the episode aired, and I still don't understand what I did that was wrong. I'm going to play his call for you. In just a moment, this is from the Andrew Lawton Show on AM 980 on uh, sorry November 25th. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit about our hair trigger reaction to what is offensive or racist or insensitive afterwards. But for now, I just want you to hear his call to judge for yourself. Good. Uh, my comment is not so much on the refugees coming into Canada. My comment is on a comment that you made about uh, in your last thing about Minister Singh. You called him the Sikh warrior. I, I thought that was extremely disrespectful. This is a gentleman who was a police officer, he elected by the citizens of Canada as an MP. He, he was a soldier in the Canadian Armed Forces. And for you to address him as the Sikh warrior, I thought was extremely Disrespectful. Did you see the viral? Did no? Listen to me. Did you see no, the no, no, viral no. story in the CBC last week that I'm, was? I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to the CBC. I'm talking to you. Yeah, but you're, it was meant. Confident. It was meant in, in. It was meant in a very if respectful way. This is. I, I clearly get that this is your your radio show, but you give me an opportunity to call up. Let me voice my opinion. I thought it was extremely disrespectful. This. It, it doesn't really matter what the CBC says. This was coming from you. This is a gentleman who put his line. In, in harm's way to protect other countries, including Canadians, with the Canadian flag on his side. And for you to call him the Sikh warrior was extremely disrespectful. Why? Because He is ever, Sikh and he has fought this country. No, you asked me a question. He is Sikh. Okay. He has fought this country with honor. He's fought it with dedication. To call him a Sikh warrior, which, by the way, I was quoting, is meant in respect. So how is it disrespectful? Have you ever called any other white minister of defense anything but the Minister of Defense in the last 150 years that we've had one in, in our country. Have you ever? Have you ever? Yeah, absolutely. If they've been a soldier, well, unfortunately, the okay. last few we had haven't been. Well, they've all had positions. You, you've called them the Minister of Defense. Yeah, and I you, called him the Minister. You're, you're splitting hairs over something here. You're finding no, offense in something that I don't think no, no. anyone was offended by. And please, if you're a Sikh who listened in that was offended by that, I want to hear from you. I would hope that there would be Sikhs. I hope there would be just people from every different organization or just Canadians. I, I just found it extremely disrespectful. I, I, I mean, yes, he is Sikh. You're right. But if he was black, would you call him the black soldier? No, the fact the is a Sikh warrior? War, Sikh warrior is a term. But it, it, you're, you're missing the point. I get that it's a term. I clearly get that it, it is. But the point is that you, he should not be just recognized because he's Sikh. He should be recognized because what he's done. And, Which and he is, was. And, and this is this nonsense, political correct garbage how, that how people that, can't how, even how take that? something that's meant as a compliment, as a compliment, I, and recognize a panacea of media coverage, not just from Canada, left-wing media, right-wing media in Canada, around the world, honoring a man who has fought for this country and who is some who is a Sikh. And the, the fact is that is a culture that has a background of being warriors. So to honor him based on that and to have that maligned as being offensive is absolutely absurd. It's an asinine. Uh, it's an asinine uh, representation of what I said and what I meant. No, it's it's not. That's your opinion that it's asinine. As it's your opinion that it's offensive and not shared by any other Sikh that I have ever seen or heard from. So, Douglas, thanks for playing here. But this is exactly the problem now: is that we have people who I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume, and maybe this is the problem here, a, a white person calling in offended on someone else's behalf because the compliment wasn't worded correctly. The compliment wasn't worded well enough for him. So that was from November 25th on The Andrew Lawton Show. And I didn't play the whole show for you, but if you want to listen online, you can. I had people write in, and I've actually had since the show uh, happened, a Sikhs write in and say that one of them said that guy's an idiot. Others have said it was entirely inoffensive. I actually looked up just on an offhanded sort of basis the Wikipedia page for Sikh warriors, and it has the entire background of what that means, what that term means. And it has a list of all of the Sikh warriors, people who in many cases died to be called that, to be understood as that. And how funny that a white liberal is offended on behalf of someone else for their beliefs and their culture, which values battle, which values strength and fortitude and courage. You know what a warrior is, what a warrior does. And I've yet to hear anyone else, thankfully, who was offended by it, Sikh or otherwise. But I have heard from Sikhs who have said, yeah, I, I see no problem with that. 
And the fact that it was a quote of other media notwithstanding and not something that's been denied nor rejected by the minister himself, it's kind of funny because whenever I talk about, you know, a liberal does this wrong, a liberal does this wrong, people will write in and say, you're being mean to liberals. You don't say anything nice about liberals. Here we have one of the most competent and capable defense ministers, not just liberal defense ministers, but defense ministers the country's ever seen in terms of his own resume. And all of a sudden to praise him for his resume is now offensive if you reference his religion. Well, look, he and a number of people in in cabinet are appointed because they bring diversity to the table. This is something that Justin Trudeau has quite proudly stated as a priority for him. So to ignore that he is a Sikh would be equally offensive. In political correctness land, which is unfortunately where we're living from a public communications perspective, you are politically incorrect if you don't reference someone's race and ethnicity. You are politically incorrect if you do, apparently, even if you're complimenting them. Equally offensive. So I don't know. There's no rule book that I think effectively encapsulates what our obligation as citizens is in the parameters that have been laid out by the left here. And a part of me is saddened for you because you're hearing that for the first time and you are now exposed to a level of absurdity that exists in the world that maybe you were okay living without knowing about up until you listened to the show. And for that, I am truly sorry. I can't take that back. I cannot make you unhear that. But you know what? I've had to listen to it three times now, once when it happened, once right now, and once when I listened to it before the show. So I think I have it worse than you in that regard. But here we have it. This hair trigger reaction, that's the best way I can describe it. And I know I did it before to use a gun terminology, which should uh, reach out to a few of you. This hair trigger reaction that just needs the slightest of a flinch for something to be classified as offensive or as disrespectful. And someone else pointed out to me after that aired, and I I hadn't actually thought to mention this on air, why do Sikhs walk around with a dagger? Because let's face it, it's a religion that values being ready for battle. And I know that the Kirpan, as it's known, has a deeper significance. It's one of the five articles of faith. But the fact is, the... The thing itself, the item, means that you have to have the courage to defend the rights of those who are oppressed or persecuted. That's what it means. Not through words, but through actions. So it literally means it has to be, as, or you have to be as a Sikh battle ready. That's what the item means. So that's why they're warriors. In my eyes, to ignore that, to pretend that's not the case, to pretend that's not a part of his background, his training, his resolve and his resilience that led to him serving this country, that would be disrespectful. Disrespectful of him as a soldier, disrespectful of him as, of him as a minister, and darn right, disrespectful of him as a Sikh. And let's not also forget how much the Sikh community has done in battle for Western nations, for allied nations throughout the course of history in all parts of the world. And I know that this is not connected to the refugee discussion, but it was something that was born out of a refugee discussion I had on my show. But I think it speaks to one of the big problems we're seeing in the refugees discussion. And this is how I wanted to bring it back here, because we're seeing a group of people who are, instead of debating in facts, instead of debating in terms of realities, instead of living in reality, people are more concerned about optics. More concerned about what looks the right way, sounds the right way, smells the right way, and so on and so forth. And when I look at the refugee discussions that are going on right now, which I mentioned a little bit on the program last week, and I wanted to reiterate here if you missed it, that this is a five-year-old conflict. There have been people needing to escape persecution in Syria for five years. The West only started to care in September. When Alan Kurdi, son of Abdullah Kurdi, washed up dead face down on a beach in Turkey. 
People then forgot again and only started to discuss it again days after the Paris attack. That's when it became a lot more real. And then you had the rollout of Justin Trudeau's plan. And things become a bit more relevant for Canadians. And I'm convinced that Canada has a moral obligation to help, a moral obligation to help people in need. That does not supersede our security needs, however. And my problem with how the refugee strategy has been rolled out has not been the actual plan itself or the commitment to it itself. It's been the process. And I find uh, Ujel Dosanjh, former Liberal federal minister and former British Columbia premier's comments on this, to be incredibly apt. Speaking out against Kathleen Wynne, Ontario premier's assert- assertion that anyone who objects to refugees being brought in instantly and quickly and swiftly and all that sort of stuff is racist or xenophobic. This is what Kathleen Wynne has said in no uncertain terms. And Dosanjh, a minority himself, from a family of immigrants, have, has said, look, you're calling me racist when you come out with comments like this. And he also proved that it's not a left-right issue as well. There are challenges that need to be met. And the conservatives and even the New Democrats have been speaking about these challenges for months, painfully aware of the logistical challenges, the security challenges, and the resource challenges. But no, Justin Trudeau says instead we can do it. 25,000 by December 31st. Happy New Year, 25,000 people in this country. It was never more than an empty promise. But he said we're going to do it. They trotted out in the last couple of weeks security experts who said, yep, you can do it. They had the head of the RCMP. They had the head of uh, CSIS, and they all said, yep, yeah, yeah, we can do it. We're, we're able to get them in. We're able to screen these people in time and, and bring them in quickly. And then there was a glimmer of hope. Hey, maybe they can actually pull this off. And then the other shoe dropped. Then the other shoe dropped, and Canadians realized, the majority of Canadians, not the people that pay attention, but the majority of Canadians who only passively are aware of what's going on, realized that there's no way this can happen. So earlier this week, Trudeau's cabinet gets out in front of the people of Canada and says we have to revise our numbers, 10,000 by the end of the year, then 15,000 more between January 1st and the end of February. I will preface this by saying for now, don't be surprised if there's another little hiccup later on. So they say that this is the change that needs to be made to put Canadians' needs first. And I have to say something that I never thought I would say. Good for you, Mr. Trudeau. Good for you, Prime Minister. You listen to the people. You listen to the experts. You realize that your plan was an unrealistic one, and you changed it. That is not something to scoff at. That is not something to look down upon. Quite the contrary, in fact. That is something to be lauded. Now, we do have to recognize, we have to recognize, I think anyway, that there is a broken promise component here. I mean, quite literally, it took Justin Trudeau, and I did the calculation myself, by the way, and I I, I want to get credit for that. It took him two weeks, six days, four hours and 15 minutes to break his first promise with the refugee plan. Is it a new record? I don't know. Certainly worth congratulating him on that file, though. But he listened. And what I find hilarious, and I tweeted about this, and it got like 200 retweets or something. People clearly uh, saw a level of resonance in this message here. I wrote that when we look at what happened, the Conservatives pledged 10,000 refugees. They're heartless, not doing enough. They're heel dragging. Liberals pledged 10,000. The media is like, oh, my goodness, look at how sensible it is. The media doesn't report it as a broken promise. The media reports it as a delay. You know, if the shoe was on the other foot and it was a conservative plan, the media would be talking about how Harper's dragging his heels, not wanting to bring the refugees in, etc. Forgetting that the conservatives actually did promise thousands of refugees by year end, not just Syrian, but also Iraqis. Justin Trudeau is focusing almost entirely on the Syrian refugees, which makes the numbers look a little bit bigger than 
they actually are as far as the gap between his pledge and the conservative pledge. So one thing I have to point out about this, because I haven't seen a lot of media picking this up, is that there has been this profound hypocrisy in the way the media is covering Trudeau's refugee plan compared to the way they would have if Harper were still in power and the way they did when Harper was in power during the election. And it's unsurprising. I mean, this should not be something that shocks us by now. This is what they do. This is exactly what they do. But what do we do in response to it? How do we fight this? For starters, Thanksgiving, if you're an American, is coming up. And for my American friends, they know that the Thanksgiving dinner table is the place where you can, like, have family brawls when you start talking about politics. I'm not saying that with Christmas coming up for Canadians and other people that we should be, you know, bringing our, our family into the political realm necessarily. But the change has to happen with individuals. People have to just have these conversations and say, well, you know, what about this? What about this? Because what I'm learning is uh, that skepticism of the refugee deadline is not exclusive to conservatives. I've seen a lot of people on all sides of the political spectrum, and this is very important, people who aren't even political at all, that are expressing their own reticence and their own doubts about the plans that are being rolled out in Ottawa right now. And the fact that these are all going to be, or not all of them, but the majority of them are going to be uh, privately sponsored refugees is as well something that is a tad of a departure from what we had been told before. Again, not a deal breaker, but something that needs to be acknowledged, something that needs to be recognized as being a little bit of a different game plan here. And therein lies what I think needs to be the focal point of these discussions. How is what Trudeau doing any different than what Harper would be doing? Is it even at all? Because I don't really think it is. I think the plans were already in motion. People, you know, try to paint Harper as this xenophobic person and Kenny as the xenophobic person, not realizing that just based on immigration alone, I mean, forget refugees, immigration alone, Canada under the Conservatives brought in drastically more immigrants per year than ever before, if I'm not mistaken. And these were all coming from regions of the world where there was ethnic diversity and religious diversity. So it's not even this Harper hates Muslims sort of thing. I mean, did you hear the interview that Christia Freeland did with Bill Maher? I think Seth Rogen was on the stage as well. I mean, she absolutely bombed because she's trying to give this defense of multiculturalism, which, by the way, is in its current form in Canada indefensible official state-mandated multiculturalism. But more importantly, she's up against a guy who is prepared to call out any religion in a way that she won't. And look, I don't like Bill Maher that much, but I realize that conservatives have a relationship of convenience with him because conservatives love it when he turns on the left and then we hate it when he turns on the right again. The fact is he is a leftist, but he's not really one of the institutional leftists. He's not really one of the elites on the left. He is one of these people who, when push comes to shove, is prepared to throw his own side, if you will, under the bus. And I think that's what we saw in his interview with Minister Freeland. And while it wasn't particularly shocking, and I don't think it matters that much because, you know what, people are going to say it's a hatchet job anyway, or people won't really pay attention that much. But what I have to point out here is that when she goes and starts talking about, well, you know, everyone's equal, all people are equal, all religions are equal, you know, we need more diversity, not less of it. She's showing a profound ignorance to where the problems in the world are coming from. And keeping in mind that even in Syria, What is it that the regime there is fighting against? What is it that ISIS is fighting against? Religious diversity. I mean, that they don't want to have different factions within Islam. They don't want to have different beliefs. They don't want to have uh, religious minorities. So the Liberal Party comes out with its plan that we're going to bring in no single men, except gay men. 
Now, I don't know what they're going to do to enforce that, and I don't want to know what happens behind closed tents at refugee sites is none of my business. But then you had the same people criticizing several months ago Stephen Harper for saying he wants to prioritize. And this doesn't mean put to the front of the line, by the way. It doesn't mean prioritize over others. It just means make a priority. Persecuted religious minorities who have the same threat of persecution in these territories as you could argue gay men do. Why is it that they are not worthy of the support? Why is it that a single Christian male is not a priority for the government? And then there's the question of if the security screening is so flawless, why not bring in screened vetted men? And to be clear, I'm not against the policy. I think that if we are embarking upon this as a humanitarian cause, I think women and children should be the first priority. Don't break up families, of course. But women and children, I think, should be the obligation. I don't think any man that wants to cut the line in favor of his sisters, cousins, neighbors that are women and children, I don't think he's deserving of a place in Canada if he's not prepared to do the honorable thing and step aside for someone else in that boat. But if we are going to recognize that this is where the government is putting its efforts, we have to be prepared to point out the hypocrisy in such a thing. We know how to search and screen and we're doing it perfectly and this is not just a system of trust, but just in case, no men. Just in case, no single men, because, well, you never know. You never know what's going to happen. So I don't think at all that they have thought this through as much as they think they have. And, and I think, look, when we're dealing with a crisis like this, everyone needs to be on the same side. As Canadians, we need to, I don't mean politically, by the way, be on the same side, but we need to be a united front. We're all in this together. Once the refugees are here, it's up to Canadians to help them integrate. It's up to Canadians to help them become a part of Canada. And it's actually been inspiring to see local groups that have stepped up to the plate and said, we will do that. People who will open their homes. I don't have the space, I assure you. But there are other people who do. Story went around in, in southern Ontario the other day. A Guelph businessman is opening up uh, his wallet and sponsoring 50 families. Not 50 people, 50 families. And that's great. You know, I, I've actually seen a split in conservatives and in people on the right on this because uh, you get some people, and especially in the U.S., you're, you're, I'm seeing this divide. People saying, we don't want a single refugee, we don't want any, they're all terrorists in waiting, or, you know, maybe some of them are terrorists, some of them aren't. And then you have people on the other side that are saying, you know, we need to, you know, open our arms, and who cares if a couple of them are terrorists, let everyone in. I don't think that either absolute is the right answer here. I think, obviously, for a country that brings in as many immigrants as Canada does, we can deal with people in need. I think for a country that has the space we do, we can bring in people in need. And, you know, I actually, as a Christian, had a, a really interesting conversation with a woman from my church on Sunday, just casually, and we were chatting. And she's not political at all, which is why I found it to be a really interesting conversation. And she said, you know, a lot of these people have never been exposed to Christianity in Syria. Or if they were, they turned it down because they didn't want to, you know, die because they were talking about Christianity. So she says them being in Canada gives an opportunity for that to happen that never would have existed, which for them can be transformative. And yeah, not that I, I make policy decisions based on my faith, but it was still an interesting side of the discussion that I hadn't really considered before. And I get that we all, as people on the right or people sympathetic to the right, have a level of skepticism towards government. I am by the way, leading the charge on skepticism or general distrust in government. My faith in government does not amount to a hill of beans. So when I'm told that, oh, the RCMP and CSIS are, are guaranteeing that all these people are safe, I'm not as convinced as I should be, as all Canadians deserve to be about something like that. So there is that. There is going to be that risk. But that risk exists with any immigration in Canada. 
That risk exists with someone driving across the Windsor-Detroit border, someone driving across the Buffalo-Niagara border, someone walking through a farmer's field to cross the North Dakota-Manitoba border. I mean, these risks are there on a daily basis anyway. And I've had a bit of a change in the way that I viewed the refugee crisis since the start, because when certain details are confirmed, like the fact that they're being screened over there, that's a big one. Like the fact that now we are delaying the timeline. I don't think the need exists to have a deadline in the first place. And this is where I've had the biggest departure from Justin Trudeau's approach to this. I don't buy that we needed to have a a number set by this date, and that's what we're going to do in Canada, because if you're going to do it right, it's going to take however long it takes. You know, there was this episode of a TV show I watched years ago, and they were talking about a, a concept that was not unique to the show, by the way. And... It kind of reminded me of of something that we can apply here. It's called the, I think, the project management triangle. The project management triangle, and it means, or it's also called the iron triangle. And it means that you have three different qualities of any project. You have the time it takes, how much it costs, and how good the quality is. If you want to break it down, fast, cheap, good. And the mentality is that you can only get two of them. You can't change one side without impacting the others. So if you want it done efficiently and you want it done well, it's going to take time. If you want to do it fast and you want to do it cheaply, well, I'm afraid it's not going to be that well done. And there's no mathematics on this, by the way, but it's something rooted in common sense. So when we look at this and apply it to what we're seeing now, I don't think anyone should be all that surprised that this is going to take longer. My promise to you, if I were Justin Trudeau right now, would be, you know what? It's going to take when it takes. It's going to take however long it takes. We're bringing in 25,000 people. This is no small task. We can safely and comfortably get in this many people a day. It might take until March even. It might take until April. But you know what? The people that come here, you can have absolute faith, are going to be those who want to integrate and assimilate into Canada. And these people are safe where they are. It's not like that's a matter of leaving people waiting in a war zone in Syria. No, you're bringing people who are safely in camps in Lebanon. They can afford to wait. They've been waiting for years. And I don't want to sound heartless or or callous in that, but I think they would also be appreciative of things being done right as well, because after all, why would they want to go to a country that has the same threats of where they just came from? We've got to take a quick break here. When we come back in just a couple of moments, we'll have more Lawton Online on the rebel.media. Stay tuned. He's unapologetic, unwavering, and unafraid to take on the left sacred cows. He's Andrew Lawton, and you're listening to Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. Welcome back. This is Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. And I wanted to, this episode, continue a little bit of what I started last week, which was recapping what I had the opportunity to do and see and hear and the people with whom I met in Israel a couple of weeks ago, because one of the really interesting things, and I mentioned this a little bit last week about the trip, was just how multidimensional and how multifaceted Israel is. And you have your religious uh, undertones, you have your political undertones, your cultural, your uh, all of these things coming together. And one of the interesting takeaways that I got was learning about an organization called Sharat Hadin, 
Israel Law Center. Now, I had heard of it before, but I, I was not very familiar with it. And when all of us in the group, it was a, a small group of media people and other journalists from across the country, were speaking about the people we met and the speakers we had, I can't remember the numbers, but almost everyone cited this woman who's about to join me on the show as being one of the best that we heard. Her story is incredible. We all sort of joked that it was a movie in the making. Uh, Sherrod Hadeen is going after terrorism through the court system, not on the battlefield. And surprisingly, they are winning with, if I'm not mistaken, $2 billion in judgments. They've actually collected uh, millions and millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, as a matter of fact. And they file injunctions. They're currently uh, trying to get Facebook to start uh, blocking people from posting incitations uh, to violence and terror online. And we can talk about that and the censorship angle a little bit later. But it's important to note that Facebook does employ censorship in other areas. So I'm very pleased to welcome to the show Nitsana Darshan Leitner. Now, I spoke with her on my radio show last week, and I also heard her in uh, Jerusalem speaking a little bit about what her organization is doing. And here's that interview now. Nitsana, thank you so much for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Now, we had the, the privilege of, of chatting last week, and I have to tell you, mm-hmm. everyone in the group was for, for days talking about the work that you're doing because it, it's such, mm-hmm. I think, a unique perspective on a, on a fight against terrorism that we're all familiar with, but not in the way that you've had to combat it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, this is a, absolutely a, a hard work, but uh, very successful. Uh, we can elaborate a little bit more about it. Yeah, because the Facebook one, I think, is the most interesting because we hear stories all the time whenever there is a terrorist attack or a terrorist threat and and media will and usually dig not very deeply and find some example of someone posting on Facebook that they wanted to do this, that they were going to do this. So how does Facebook factor into the work that you're doing? I haven't given people much of the backstory because I wanted you to share where you've been coming from with this lawsuit. Right. So, um, as everybody knows, in the past month, month and a half, uh, Israel has been suffering a horrific wave of terrorism, where people just getting up and stabbing Jews, stabbing Israelis, uh, and then killing them. And um, where before the incitement to kill Jews, to kill Israelis, were done in the mosques, in the town squares, in leaflets that the terror organization were printing out and giving it to the public, Today, it's done in the social media, and the social media is so effective. The uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter are so popular among the youth in the Palestinian Authority that it reached everyone. And you can find in the past month and a half tens of thousands of posts encouraging people to go and kill Jews. They actually give out instructions or directions how to do it most effectively. They gave they give videos of illustrating where to stab with a knife, how to twist the knife, where to stand and ambush the Jews, how to distinguish them between tourists to others. And then when people get up and stab, they post on Facebook that they are going to become shaheed. They are confessing. They are like saying they're less real. They say that they are going to liberate Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they are going to start a new intifada. And they go and step. And after their act, you will find thousands of posts glorifying their act, endorsing it, encouraging people to follow them. So all this excitement steering up this horrific wave of terrorism. Israel approached Facebook, which is the most popular social media network in, in, among the Palestinians, and asked them to block the incitement. Ask them to tone it down. But Facebook said that they are only a bulletin board, that they are not getting involved with the content, that each time someone approaches them with a request to take down a post, they check it, and if they find it um, fit their community values, they will not take it down. So we decided to sue Facebook 
What's interesting here is that there have been controversies in North America where women have posted pictures of themselves breastfeeding, and this gets taken down by Facebook, and people are protesting because they say Facebook's community standards are just too strict. And then you have Facebook in the Middle East where people are glorifying and promoting the killing of innocent Jews, and this somehow doesn't fit the bill for violating community standards. That right. seems like a very wide chasm between those two. Not really, because um, yeah, well, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. But here you're talking actually about about speech that is not forbidden anymore, speech that causes a, a violence. Um, yeah, yeah, this, this is not just unpopular speech. opinions. These are actually threats mm -hmm. and incitements. Absolutely, they get the motivated people to go and take a knife and go outside and kill. And there is a bar, there is a limit to freedom of speech. We all know it. It's when it causes, when speech causes an imminent danger, it becomes illegal. And this is what we're trying to get Facebook to do, to stop the illegal speech. They have an obligation like this, a moral obligation and a legal obligation. They are a social network. They have social responsibility. Now, you're not asking Facebook for money, just an injunction, correct? Right. right. Why, why, are they, for, yeah. why are they fighting this, though? Because to me, this seems like something that <laughs> devalues their service anyway. They don't want to have any blood on their hands, I would assume. So what is the issue here? Yeah. Well, first, we need to know their answer. They're supposed to respond uh, within uh, 30 days. They may have uh, extension of uh, additional time and to see the response. But basically, um, they should not... They should not fight it. They should, um, they, even even if they want a, a, an open space and they want free space and they really don't want to get involved, they do. They actually do. They do it in other countries. They do it in Russia. They do it in China. They do it in Turkey. In Turkey, nobody gets up and can post, post against the administration. It's forbidden. So Facebook has the ability and the exercise is, right in different countries around the world. They also have the ability to monitor the uh, incitement, the way they know what coffee I drink in the morning or yeah. uh, what type of clothes I know to, uh, what to wear. And they connect me with my friends and they push ads that I like and I show interest in. They have the ability to monitor the incitement and to take it down. It's, it's, it's really an obligation. I really... Uh, hope that Facebook will come to its senses and will agree with us. If not, it may very well turn to a monetary lawsuit because in the end of the day, no one in the United States is allowed to add and abet a terror organization. It's forbidden according to the Anti-Terrorism Act. And if a lawsuit was filed against Facebook for monetary damages, they would pay hundreds of millions of dollars compensation. I don't know if they want really to go to this place. We only have a couple of moments left here, uh, Nitsana, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of the other successes you've had, because most people, like I mentioned at the beginning of the segment, view the fight against terrorism as being one that happens in the desert. And when mm -hmm. I've looked at successes you've had uh, going after banks that have worked with ISIS, going after uh, Iran, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit, uh, in, a, in a couple of moments anyway, about uh, what the successes you've had going through the banking, or going after the banking systems have been. Well, um, in the beginning of the Intifada, we've been filing lawsuits against banks that provide financial services to terror organizations like Hamas, like Hezbollah, uh, American banks, European banks, our banks. And uh, as a result of these cases, um, banks really start to change the way they're doing businesses. As a matter of fact, this lawsuit sent a shockwave for the international banking system that no bank agrees anymore to open bank accounts to a designated organization. Uh, no bank agrees to provide financial services to Islamic charity that identifies with the organization or raise funds for the organization. And no bank agreed to operate in terror zones like South Lebanon, like Gaza. There is no banking system in Gaza. This is why we're receiving smuggling money into Gaza with suitcases and cash through the tunnels. But that caused the organizations in Gaza a great deal of harm because they need hundreds of millions of dollars. They're running an alternative government in Gaza. They need a lot of money to support the population, to gain their loyalty. 
They need a lot of money to run their military. They have tens of thousands of soldiers. They get a salary, um, a very high one. They uh, support the prisoners who are sitting in the Israeli jail. They get compensation on a monthly basis. They build these sophisticated, huge tunnels that um, they used to come from Egypt to Israel to smuggle ammunition, money, terrorists. Today they're going from Israel into from Gaza into Israel to smuggle terrorists to kill Israelis. So to maintain all this infrastructure, Hamas budget sent today on half a billion dollars. They need a bank to transfer all this money into the Gaza Strip. We were told by the security service in Israel that as a result of the cases against the banks, money diverted to terrorism reduced in 60 percent. Because in the end of the day, if you stop the flow of the money, you can stop the flow of the terrorism. Well, I'm glad you've had such success on that portfolio. Uh, Nitsana Darshan Leitner joining me on the line, founder of Sharat Hadin Israel Law Center. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak with you last week and a pleasure to speak to you again today, Nitsana. Thank you very much for your time. A pleasure as well. You're welcome. Now, that right there is like, like I, I joked earlier, I mean, someone who should be starring in a movie. I mean, think like the firm, but with Israelis and terrorists and courts and a heck of a lot more interesting. I'm going to play for you another interview that I did when I was over there. Now, this is actually an interview that I recorded in East Jerusalem with uh, Maher Shalabi. Now, he is a, a Palestinian journalist. He hosts a TV show called Transparent, and he has interviewed on it. I mean, John Kerry, he's had uh, uh, Palestinian Authority uh, President Mahmoud Abbas. He's had a number of these players in foreign policy on his show before, and, and he broadcasts out of Ramallah, which is the, the seat of the government in the West Bank. And when I spoke to him, it was very unique, by the way, because as much as people tried to accuse my trip of being, you know, some mass Zionist conspiracy, here we are speaking to a journalist who's, who's very critical of, of Israel and who, by the way, was driving from Ramallah to Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, which is 15 minutes, and it took him two hours because of checkpoints. So I understand his grievances with the status quo in Israel. But at the same time, I also think that it's important to hear that, A, there is another side to this dispute, but also, and this is the more important part, to hear how that side, not only him as a journalist, but how he describes his audience as viewing these issues, as viewing the Middle Eastern policy and politics items, that we look at it from even further away. So this is Maher Shalabi, recorded in East Jerusalem at the American Colony Hotel. I wanted to talk about something you mentioned in your remarks a couple of moments ago. I am a talk radio host, so I know all about taking calls, talking to people. And you said that one discussion that you had was asking what people think about knife stabbings. And, and that shocked me because as a talk radio journalist in Canada, that's not a question. That's not something where there's ever going to be different opinions on. So tell me, as someone who's worked in the United States and, and obviously working in, in the Palestinian territory... What does it feel like that something like that is stabbing okay actually has two sides to it? Some people support that. Yes, some people support that, but uh, uh, the majority don't support it. The majority looking for a better life, uh, freedom, uh, to live in their own state. Uh, those kids, actually, who start uh, the stabbing, I think, in my in my point of view, uh, they did it because of the pressure they're living in. Uh, uh, if anybody sent them to do a stabbing, I think, in my point of view, they are terrorists. But also, uh, if we, what's the reason? The reason, in my point of view, is occupation, and occupation is the terrorist, the real terrorist. Are there uh, supporters uh, of, of Hamas in uh, the West Bank as well that you have to, to interact with in, in the course of your job? Yes, and I have them in my show too. I mean, they're part of uh, our people. I have them in my show too. Uh, but to be honest with you, the majority of Palestinian people, if you look at Palestinian people, they're fed up actually from uh, occupation, they fed up from the situation, 
And when Hamas, somebody like Hamas, have a chance in election or in their political uh, uh, life, they uh, do it because there is no other solution for people. They are, the people become desperate of the situation. More settlement activity, uh, more uh, action and aggression by the Israeli army, and people see that uh, uh, the peaceful solution that the leadership calling for reaching nowhere. So in a way, uh, because of this, I think radical uh, have uh, points to succeed in, 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 uh, in, in reaching where, the, where they want to reach. We often hear that peace is the goal. Israelis talk about wanting peace, Palestinians talk about wanting peace, and it's such a, an easy thing to say, and obviously we've seen over the course of history that it, it, it's not happening. So, so what is the, the biggest impediment to peace for, from, from either side? I mean, for, from Israeli actions, but also from Palestinian actions? I tell you, to answer you in my way, uh, both sides saying two-state solution, both Israeli Prime Minister mm -hmm. saying two-state solution, Israeli uh, saying two-state solution. But what kind of two-state solution they want? We want to live side by side with Israel. Uh, we want to have our own state. We don't want to be controlled by anybody as Palestinian. Uh, we're looking for our uh, right, freedom, uh, normal life. Uh, I think the only solution, the only solution, there to have two-state solution, but Israeli action, Israeli uh, uh, works in, in the ground leading us to one state solution, and this is in the future. For us as a Palestinian, we are in our land. We don't mind it. With, in the future, it will be one state solution, and as I told one Israeli one day, one of Israeli leaders, we will call it Palestine in 20, 30 years, 40 years, because we will be the majority, and we will use the Israeli democracy to call it Palestine. So I think in the benefit, I'm talking to you openly, mm -hmm. in the benefit of Israel to have two-state solution. But Israel leading us to one state solution, not two-state solution. The narrative we get from Israel, though, is that Israel wants a two-state solution and it's the Palestinians that are blocking that, and you're saying the opposite. So where does that divide come from? Well, Israel wants a two-state solution uh, in their own way, where they control 70% of the uh, 1967 border, and this is no way. 67 border, according to international law, uh, is the border of the Palestinian uh, state, uh, with East Jerusalem its capital. This is a solution, I tell you, I can sell it now to 99.9% .9 of the Palestinian immediately. But for Israeli to say they want two-state solution, keeping controlling our life, this is no way. We cannot accept to live as slaves anymore. The last question I'd ask you, uh, Maher, can a Palestinian journalist criticize publicly the Palestinian leaders? I do. I, in my show, I t t tell you what I did one time in my show, and this is, <laughs> I have Salam Fayyad as a prime minister in my show, and I asked him a question, and he started circling around, answering me, and I uh, said to him, you, the president and the government, should sleep in a democratic country, you should sleep in prison tonight. Wow. And I have it as a promo for my <laughs> program for three months. Nobody, I mean, did anything. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Now, uh, Mr. Shalaby was actually the inspiration for a component of a piece that I had in the Toronto Sun last week. And I spoke about that a little bit on the show last week, but he was the one that I was talking about when I was writing about him asking a question to his listeners, as you just heard, is stabbing okay? And he said most said no. Okay, well, good. Most said no. Well, what about the ones who didn't? And this is why, for all that I am sympathetic, and make no mistake, I am, to the plight of the Palestinians who want freedom, who want mobility, who want access, who want the things that all of us in Canada enjoy as fundamental freedoms. We also have to look at the Israelis who want safety, who want security, who want the comfort that can only come with the status quo. And not even then, because... Clearly, even the security mechanisms employed now aren't enough, some might say. 
So I think that anyone who's looking for a black and white answer, and usually I'm not the one that deals in shades of gray, by the way, but anyone looking for a black and white answer is, is are Israelis persecuted, are Palestinians persecuted, is off the mark. Look, I am a Zionist. I am pro-Israel. I believe Israel has a right to exist and to defend itself. I would love a solution that led to Palestinians not feeling the need to be violent. But again, that's also based on this belief that you can reason your way out of that mentality, which clearly you can't. But anyway, people say, well, why don't you have the both sides on? Well, look, there you have both sides. You can decide for yourself what you think. And I want to hear what you think about both guests and about, in general, anything that comes up on the show. My email address, andrew at andrewlawton.ca. We have to take a quick break here. More Lawton Online coming up on the rebel.media momentarily. Stay tuned. You're listening to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton exclusively on the rebel.media email your thoughts to andrew at andrewlawton.ca or tweet andrew using at andrew lawton okay so at the top of the show i mentioned there is a story unfolding in which feminists are now upset that they're getting the preferential treatment that they wanted when it comes to applying for jobs That was the simplest way of describing what is a pretty convoluted story that I'm not sure should be a story, but it is. So I I want to give it the credit it's due here. A a Toronto web design firm called uh, Vestra Inet is seeking a new employee for its growing operation. They're looking for, and I'm going to read not the whole job description, but parts of the job description for you. Someone to manage their web content. They want someone to write new website content for clients, to update existing text to make them SEO friendly. They want someone to write uh, blog posts to update Facebook, Twitter, and, and Google Plus profiles. They want someone to converse with clientele. They want someone with computer knowledge, organizational abilities, oral and written skills. Uh, quote, knowledge of Russian is a plus, unquote. So I, I don't know about that, but they, they want all of these pretty reasonable things for someone to work in social media, communications, etc., But then there is this line in the LinkedIn job description, quote, please note that the position requires filling in the responsibilities of a receptionist. So female candidates are preferred. And all of a sudden, this whole thing has derailed. The LinkedIn job posting that I'm sure a number of people were interested in has all of a sudden become the subject of the ire of social media. Now, when I was talking earlier on in the show about that hair trigger reactionism, uh, that was in full gear here, by the way. People were already threatening to boycott clients of this company. People were saying, you know, they should never get their business done here again and, and all that sort of stuff that people will have forgotten about in the next couple of days. But I have to say, uh, once I get this fly off, my there's a fly literally on my microphone, and I know if I whack it, there's going to be a big boom. Okay, there we go. The fly's dead. We're good to go. The uh, casualties of podcasting, as they call it. In any, I'm looking at the uh, the spike on the recorder, and, and that seemed to have been a, a bigger boom than it, than it felt like on my end. In any case, who says I'm not irreverent, right? But the posting here, the posting here has, I think, presented some interesting problems, some interesting challenges, because I always thought employers were supposed to offer preferential hiring to women, along with, you know, minorities and disabled persons and Aboriginal people and uh, a sexual orientation minorities in the case of the University of Toronto, as I reported a few years ago. So so I'm, I'm surprised now that we're turning back the clock and, and we're not trying to give preference or give accommodation to the applications of people in these choice groups. I can't keep track of what's expected of us. And, and you know what? As far as receptionists go, I can't think of a single receptionist that I have encountered, certainly not in recent years, who is male. I'm not saying they don't exist. 
But from my doctor's office to my dentist office to my uh, office here where I work to the businesses I've dealt with, even places I've called, I can't remember the last time that I encountered a male receptionist. Now, there are some friendly, welcoming, more uh, warm men who I'm sure have great phone manner. But you know what? I don't think it's sexist to suggest that there are certain areas where women are proficient and being friendly and welcoming is one of them. Being friendly and welcoming is one of those situations where women are better than men, or at the very least, there's a perception that women are better than men, which from an employer's perspective is as good as gold, because it means your consumers are going to respond well, your customers are going to respond better by having a woman answering your phones and greeting people than a man. And anyone who thinks that businesses don't already have this in the back of their minds when they're hiring anyway is, I think, a little bit naive. In a lot of cases, they just aren't advertising that they hold this belief that a receptionist is a woman's job. And by the way, I think it just means that you have to answer the phone once when you're working. Like, it's not even a full-time receptionist. It just means that when you're not updating the website, you may have to, you know, say hello to someone that comes into the office face-to-face. But the social media reviews were not kind to this company. Lauren Souch writes, guys, we did it. We traveled back in time to 1950. Oh, wait, no, that's just a sexist job description. Davis Carr writes blatant sexism. The author of Bad Feminist, uh, Roxanne Gay, uh, weighed in just saying, oops. Naming and shaming companies that uh, used Vestra iNet to design their websites has started online as well. And ultimately, I'm still not entirely convinced there's a problem here. Because if they ever said, oh, you know, receptionist duties, but, you know, we want to hire men for this role. People would be outraged, of course. They'd say, you know, why are you taking this away from women? The easiest thing, the best thing to do would have been to not mention any gender or any sex. And I'm sure that whoever posted the listing is regretting not doing that now. But I just find it hilarious that in a culture that vehemently defends affirmative action over a meritocracy, that there is this level of a disconnect here. That when someone quite candidly said, you know what, we'd prefer a woman for this job, they are vilified, they are pilloried. And we're supposed to accept that this is just the norm now, that you can't do any right. It's like when I was talking about earlier on calling the Minister of Defense a Sikh warrior. If you didn't acknowledge it, you'd be pilloried for that. And if you do acknowledge it, you're pilloried for that as well. So there's really no pleasing the PC ninnies. It's like that line from one of the Austin Powers movies. I can't remember which of the three Austin Powers movies it was, but it's like, I see there's no pleasing you, Mr. Powers. I think it was Goldmember, because that sounds like my, my Goldmember voice. So if I'm doing the right one, that's the right movie. But my goodness, to say that women are better at a job than men is not offensive. But you know that if the shoe were on the other foot, it would be which is why I find this particularly interesting. So I'd love the employer to respond and say, okay, on second thought, we require a male receptionist now. And then the same people are going to be up in arms saying, well, wait, whoa, 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 wait. Now you're discriminating against women. Now you are not letting women have their shot in the workforce. And we're back to where we are here. So the second you go into this category of starting to identify people based on a group rather than based on their abilities, there's no pleasing anyone. There's always going to be an imbalance there. I just find it funny that now the left is jumping on its own argument here. No, no, no. No, 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 people. Whoever's best for the job, regardless of sex. Okay, I'm going to remember that next time we are looking for a position that you think should be an affirmative action hire. More Lot Online coming up in a few moments' time here on the Rebel.media. Stay tuned, my friends. It's time for It Must Be a Liberal, only on Lawton Online. Scouring every corner of the globe for stories so outrageous, there must be a liberal involved. Yes, you heard the man. It's time on Lawton Online for the segment every week to wrap up the show that we call It Must Be a Liberal, scouring every corner of the globe from Syria to Sierra Leone, from Singapore 
to Sao Tome and Prince Bay, finding the story so outrageous. There must be a liberal involved. And today we actually go no further than Roma, Italia, the city of Rome, Italy, where the city has decided to smack down a booming industry in town in advance of the holy year which is the jubilee that they expect will draw millions of Catholic tourists from all around the world. And the city has decided to set its sights on centurion impersonators. Yes, centurion impersonators. I've been to Rome. I've seen them. They uh, try to uh, scowl in photos, and they charge people for it. They hang around the amphitheater. They often are a little bit aggressive, but you know what? When you're traveling, I think you need to be prepared to deal with that aggression from salespeople anyway. But the city has banned them. These cultural icons in Roman history have been banned by the city of Rome because they don't want to make people uncomfortable with an influx of tourists in the Catholic Holy Year. It's a war on capitalism, but a true centurion would never give up without a good fight. Although a statement from the city says they, they act inappropriately, and well, we, we can't have any of that. So it's safe to say that if you ban a booming tourist industry because you don't think that people can say no, it's safe to say you must be a liberal. There's really no other explanation for what's happening there, folks. We've got to say farewell for the week, but I want to give a big thanks to all who wrote in in the past week and all who listened into the podcast and all who I hope will listen to the next one. My name's Andrew Lawton. This is Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out the rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary.